Sue Graham is next to give evidence in the lockdown inquiry. Now, we know by now that lockdowns were toughest on the most vulnerable in our society. And one person who was dealt a final tragic blow was the late reality star Nikki Graham. Nikki shot to fame for her contagious energy and wicked wit in 2006 when she entered the Big Brother house, fast becoming a fan favourite for her legendary tantrums about, you know, the air conditioning or cornflakes or even new housemates. But her life took a devastating turn when the nation was plunged into national lockdown. Having battled an eating disorder since she was eight years old, Nikki found herself thrown into an impossible situation, cut off from her support system with no distractions and able to fixate on food. She made light of the situation in her last Instagram post. But the truth was the barbaric restrictions robbed her of her life. She died of anorexia in April last year at the age of just 38. And one year on, a Channel 4 documentary called Nikki Graham, Who Is She? lays bare the devastating story. Lockdown was probably the worst thing that could have happened to Nikki. To be honest, if lockdown hadn't have happened, we wouldn't be sat here now. That's the reality of it. When you have something so deep and dark inside you and with Nikki living on her own and being isolated, it it took over her. This cross trainer, Nikki bought when it was announced that we were going into lockdown. Although where she lives here, they have a private gym, they announced pretty quick it was going to shut. And for Nikki, that, it just threw her into a panic. It became so difficult for her to eat if she didn't feel she'd done exercise. It was a compulsion for Nikki. This machine, it helped her to deteriorate. And Nikki's incredibly strong mum, Sue Graham, joins me now. Now, Sue, the first thing to say, and I guess a lot of people probably don't know this because I've never spoken publicly about Nikki, but we were friends. And I think, gosh, we were friends for about 12 years or or something. And she was a true, unique, inspirational person to be around. And what you saw on screen with Nikki was her true personality. And she never tried to hide away from what she was battling. She, she mm. never hid it from the world. And unfortunately, Sue, the lockdown came just at the worst possible time for her. It did. Um, and I think just before the lockdown, um, the illness had started to take its toll on her body and she just started to collapse. You know, she could have been in the supermarket, in the street, in the park, and her legs would just give way. So that had started to happen. And then when lockdown came, um, you know, she said to me on on that first day, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Because she knew. She knew the impact it was going to have on She her. did. And I said, look, uh, I was working at the time, and I said... You won't be alone. Let's go through it together as much as we can. You know, every the whole country's suffering. But I knew for, Dick, for, for Nikki it was a different story. And I said, you can come down and stay with me in Dorset and I'll come up here as often as I can and we'll support each other. But she wanted to be at her own she apartment. Did. Well, I, I think she wanted the cross trainer <laughs> to, to be with her. And it's a monster. Um... But, yeah, I think she knew the writing was on the wall. And that's why I get so angry when I think about the consequences of lockdown. Because a lot of people said, oh, it's crazy to shut gyms because we're trying to encourage people to lose weight. But for some people who have uh, illnesses like Nikki did, a gym is not a nice bonus. It can actually be an utterly crucial part of getting through each day. Yes, yeah. And that was it. That was the the real 
struggling point for Nikki because um, in order for her to allow herself to eat, um, she had to know that, you know, she'd go on the cross training, she'd go to the gym, she'd do weights and whatever else she did. And then she could come home and eat. So consequently, as soon as the gym shut... She didn't feel she could. She cut the calories back. She started to eat less and less because she couldn't exercise enough. And obviously her work was taken away as well because Nikki's job was to be out and about. Yeah, it was. But, you know, um, I think before lockdown it was, and then lockdown started, she decided that she was going to um, go to college and um, get her English and maths in GCSE. And um, because she missed out on so much education. And I think she just wanted to be like everybody else. And, and then when she did that, she did a course on teacher training, like a classroom assistant. And um, so she kept herself busy. But when lockdown came, a lot of it was done on Zoom and everything. But she passed. She passed her teaching assistant, but she'd already died. And so she didn't know. But... So, yeah, she, she did try mentally to keep herself going. It was just the physical side of things. And so do you think if it weren't for the series of lockdowns that there was a way that Nikki could still be with us? I mean, it's possible. It is possible. Um, in some ways, I think maybe it's more than a possibility. Um, it probably would have been easier for us to um, get her into a, a unit or a hospital that knew how to deal with with um, anorexia. Because unfortunately, um, not many people do. A lot of people work in these places and unfortunately they're there for the money and they don't have the kindness, the understanding, all the nurturing, which is so desperately needed. And so much of that sort of health care was pushed to the side over the course of lockdowns yes. because in a lot of cases the National Health Service became the National COVID Service, unfortunately. Exactly. Tell me what you want people to know most about Nikki. Well, um... For me, um, she was my hero. I don't think I have ever, and I'm quite old, I've lived a long time, <laughs> come across anybody more brave than that little girl. And I think the thing I admire most is um, a lot of people were shocked after they saw the documentary because they had no idea no. what she'd gone through um, because she, she never was a victim. She never said, oh, I've had a horrible life, really awful childhood, you know. She went away from me when she was eight. I didn't mother her, you know, until she was 18. And that's because she was in facilities to, yes. to, to care One for eating disorder. Other. And it was fascinating, I think, uh, for me to see why that meant she thrived so much in the Big Brother house, because she's actually the person in the world, Sue, who has spent more time I in know. Big Brother houses <laughs> than anyone in the world because she went all around the world. She became an international celebrity with us and it's because she liked the structure, she liked the routine. It's, it's what how she, she knew. grew up. Yeah, it's what she knew. And I think the other thing that, you know, because we remember these, these uh, famous meltdowns and, of course, Sue, at the time, a lot of people said, can this really be Nikki's real personality? Ooh. But this was her, right? And it's because Absolutely. of the unique circumstances of how she grew up that with Nikki, you just got her personality. So it was yeah. either very, very high, very, very low. There was no hiding it away. Exactly. But, you know, I, at the time when Nikki went into the house the first time, I was a post lady at the time and I was walking down my street with my bag and this woman stopped her car and she put the window down and she shouted, She's not really like that, is she? I said, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. 
Definitely. Well, you know what? It's so amazing to see you two because I see Nikki in you. Everybody says that. I don't see it. I really do. We're both and bonkers, but apart <laughs> from that. And I miss her very much, but I can't imagine the hole that she leaves in your life. And the reason I'm so glad uh, that you chose to speak to us today for the lockdown inquiry is I think it's so important that the victims of mental health issues and eating disorders are not forgotten again when a decision like this is made. Yes, well, just briefly, I wrote to Sajid Javid a couple of weeks back imploring him... What did you say? ..to look at mental health, eating disorders, like anorexia, overeaters, and generally people with mental mm. health issues. They don't know where to go. And have you heard back from him? I didn't, not yet, but in the paper today, he made a statement. I mean, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, but he said um, that the government are taking on board the state of the mental health issues in this country and they're going to have a 10-year plan. Well, I'm glad there's this overwhelming sense of urgency about it, you know, I mean... And it's too late for yeah. Nicky. Yeah. But look, we'll get him, we'll get on to him yes. about that and make sure that, that yeah. he has seen your letter. And of course, for help and advice related to eating disorders, you can contact BEAT, the UK's eating disorder charity, on these numbers. Helplines are open 365 days a year from 9am to midnight during the week and 4pm to midnight on weekend and bank holidays. Email contacts and a one-on-one -on -one web chat are available at beateatingdisorders.org. UK. So lovely, Sue, to remember Nikki tonight as part of our lockdown inquiry.